Uh, I didn't choose Kung Fu. I, I was, I was um, taught it from the age of four. I, there was no choice that came into it. What I aspired to was to, to make my grandfather proud of me. I'm going to Cyprus today. I'm a, I've been back since being in prison 15 years ago. It was very hard. You know, terrorists, murderers, rapists, paedophiles, thieves, drug smugglers, all in the same place. But, you know, at the end of the day, you made friends with people, you know, whether you trusted them or not. But the best friend I made was with Jesus Christ, because even in that prison there, I was able to speak to Jesus and he, he changed my life right in this place here. I was born in England, in London, to a Chinese mum and an Italian father. And when I was born, my, my father contracted an illness called multiple sclerosis, which was deteriorating his health pretty rapidly. My father's illness had a dramatic impact on the family because my mum really had to look after him full time. And to have me jumping around the house was you know, perhaps something very inconvenient for them. So, really from a young age, that's why my parents sent me off to my grandparents in China to be raised. I remember crying a lot. Everything was so different, the smells, the, the way people looked and spoke. It was all different. I sort of like realized I was in a very different place from where, where my mum and dad were living because everything was so different and you know I, um, I really didn't understand much about where I was or anything really I knew I was a long way from home I lived with my grandparents for nearly eight years and my grandfather he, he raised me in a very strict way and he did some strange things uh, in the very early stages of my, of, my, of my childhood. He would run in my, rush into my bedroom when I was fast asleep in the early hours. Of, and he would throw a bucket of cold, ice, icy water over my body to wake me up. And we would go into the stone courtyard. And in the early hours in the morning, uh, cold mornings, we, um, my grandfather would do these exercises, these movements. And, well, I did, I, you know, I, in the beginning I thought we were playing a game. I didn't really know what it was. I just had to do what he was doing. So I copied my, my grandfather. I would stand next to him and he was teaching me these movements. And I, we did this for a number of, well, all my years in China. But uh, in the very beginning I didn't understand at all what it was. I now know that, that my grandfather was a grandmaster in Kung Fu and Kung Fu has been a tradition in my family for nearly 500 years, passed down through the generations. Well, Kung Fu was first developed by an Indian monk called Bodhidharma. The Chinese refer to him as Taimo. And he traveled from India to China to spread the Buddhist teachings. And when he went to China, he went to northern China by the Hanshi Mountains. And he basically went to the Shaolin Temple. And he found that one of the things that the, the monks would do to gain control of their mind and their body was to meditate. Sometimes they would meditate on hours on end. But what he noticed is that during their meditation, many would fall asleep during their meditation. So he left that, that temple in great frustration, went into the wilderness, he tried to develop a technique to actually keep the monks awake during the meditation. 
And that's where he studied a variety of animal movements and insect movements, whether it's tigers or monkeys or snakes or praying mantis. And basically he tried to imitate those movements of those animals. He tried to understand how they would defend themselves, how they would attack. And he basically imitated those movements. And today, Kung Fu is used around the world by the military and by police as a means of hand-to-hand -hand combat or self-defense. In many respects, the animal is far more um, powerful than the human in terms of its control of its body, you know? Uh, in terms of our mind power, you combine the two and they're very powerful together. So the main animal which um, I was actually studying was the tiger. So we're going to Tai Chi Quan. And really we tried to understand and, and actually we, we followed this animal and we kept the distance, the tiger. It was a reasonably tame tiger that lived near to the, the village where we lived and in Guangdong and by the, by near to this mountain. And it was a reasonably tame animal and I tried to imitate all of its movements, the way it would attack, the way it, it, it would defend itself and I, I harnessed this, this, this skill. I never wanted to learn Kung Fu to impress my friends or to become a, gra a grand master. I was um, taught it from the age of four. I was, there was no choice that came into it. And that's the only way I could, I could almost earn his affection and his love as a grandparent. By the age of 12, my mum and dad had saved enough money for me to live with them. They were living in North London in a council flat, which was given to them by the government. And it was, they had a, a room for me to stay in. And uh, we arranged that by the age of 12, I could return to England. I was very excited, but the other emotion was I was very scared as well, because I, I really felt like I was laying foundations and roots in China now. Even though it was hard and it was very um, high, high discipline, uh, it's what, it was what I became very used to and accustomed to. Where's your, your bag, Ethan? Uh, Do you want to go get it for me, please? Sure. No, go get it. Have we got everything? You got my key, yeah? Alright, let's go. <coughs> well, should we say a little prayer? Go on, you go first. My grandfather um, laid a lot of instructions for when I came to the UK to continue um, training in martial science, in Kung Fu. And he arranged through the um, International Kung Fu Federation in Geneva, the IKFF, to sponsor me to continue learning martial science. And they made an arrangement with a school in London Now there was already a master teaching in that school, uh, we call them Shifu, and um, I was more advanced than this master, but he was older than me, and so he became my mentor. So he basically allowed me to continue training my technique, and I was actually involved in teaching others at that young age. This organization, they continued to sponsor me. I, they paid for me to travel back to Asia, to Pakistan and Thailand and China, and, and really we would enter all sorts of different competitions as well there. I was entering lots of competitions now in Asia.
And uh, I was entering the World Championships between 1987 and 1989. And I held the world title for the three years. It gave me an opportunity to make some money from my parents. And it was the International Kung Fu Federation that continues to sponsor me, training and entering competitions, until the point came when they wanted to, for me to work with them. And I was doing various assignments um, where I traveled to schools teaching Kung Fu around the world. I would be a, like a guest instructor where I would go to a school and I would be involved in, in giving um, uh, belts and levels, uh, degrees to, to students and teachers. You know, I, I did that for a while, but then I really finally got the opportunity to transfer to the security division of our organization. We ran a series of training courses for men and women coming from mainly a military background, and we would train them um, how to become close protection bodyguards. These were people that left the army that wanted to go and develop a career as a bodyguard. Uh, SWAT courses, which is special weapons and tactics, anti-terrorist courses and bomb disposal, driving tactics and language courses and there was just no end to courses and I was one of their instructors and I was training hand-to-hand -hand combat. And I worked in a gym all day long and we would be training out all day long. It was at this point where my some of my friends, they challenged me to actually become a bodyguard myself. They were just putting the idea into my mind that I could earn a lot of money with my Kung Fu skill. And well, I took the carrot because they were earning a lot of money and they were traveling around the world and I wanted a bit of excitement, something different, you know, to travel and well, I was very keen to see the rest of the world as well and earn a lot of money as I was doing it. And I finally became a fully trained bodyguard. These were people which would, you know, spend a lot of money on buying a flashy boat or a car and the next week they'll just buy a bodyguard. It was nothing on one assignment in Switzerland with um, a little boy. He, is, uh, he was under the custody of his mother. His parents had separated. His father was, um, had a very checkered past. This boy was living with his mum and uh, one day, it was a one-man assignment, and one day there was a, a kidnap attempt. And it was a real mess because the, the, there was um, a very large mansion, a very large driveway, and there was a gatehouse where there was a security guard. And this guard allowed to come onto the, the premises. And I, I just received the news now what I should have done is I should have taken that boy immediately to a safe place, to a safe spot. I should not have left his side, but I left him. And they were there to kidnap this boy with guns. There was a, a close combat situation where I, I, was, I fought with these people, even though they had firearms. It was obviously arranged by the father. And that's what it was assumed, although that was never proven, but that, that's what we assumed was the case. Well, anyway, in that situation, I was able to turn, turn the situation around, and I looked like the good guy. But actually, I'd, I did not follow the procedure, I did not follow the protocol, I should not have left that boy's son, I put that, 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 that boy, I should have stayed by him all the way, but I put his life in jeopardy. But because the boy was not kidnapped, um, I was promoted. And that's where they moved me to work with the diplomats. The main man I was working with was, was a man called Amin. And he was the Saudi, Saudi Arabian ambassador in England. And I was going to work with this guy in England and two other countries, Italy and Cyprus. Cyprus is a lovely island to come to for so many people, for its beaches, its sun, it's a lovely place to be, great food, but for me my experience of Cyprus is very different. For me it's being in this prison here, in Nicosia Central Prison, a place where every month people will get very badly beaten up or cut up or gang raped or even killed. My experience has been very different.
Bolamin was a very generous man. He uh, certainly enjoyed the good life, and when he was in the Western countries, he would gamble in casinos, so it was very lucrative for him. You know, he wanted to give me a little gift. Well, it was a big gift. It was a wad of money, about a, that thick, without exaggerating. And he offered me this money gift, and he said to me, Tony, you're doing a great job for me, and I just wanted to just a little way of saying thank you. And he did this with many of his other staff as well. And I thanked him courteously, and I was making my way to the door, when he just said, Tony, can I just ask you to do me one little favor? And he said, somebody owes me money, and they haven't paid me this money. It's from a gambling debt. So can I ask you to go and collect the money? And he wanted me to, to drive the message home that, so that nobody else would take advantage again. So he wanted me to, to hit him, to beat him. And I wasn't wired up in this way, and I, I declined. I said, I'd rather not, if that's okay, because I didn't want to hurt anybody like that. I was engaged to a girl called Aya from Sweden. She was the most amazing person I'd met by this point in my life. She was blind, and she was, uh, had a really wonderful, friendly personality, and we, you know, we were in love with each other. We wanted to get married, in fact. But when I was in Italy, she was in a friend's car in England, and they were involved in a car accident with joyriders, and she was killed in this car accident. I was lying awake last night, waiting for your call. But if the rumors are true, and I received news by telephone, and and I, um, you know, I, I began to become very bitter and twisted and angry, and and uh, I didn't want to live anymore, and I felt very suicidal. I'm trying hard to understand. What it takes to be a man. I was getting angry and violent, and I began to take out my anger on others. My, you know, Amin asked me at this point, soon after, if I was going to collect money for him again. Well, you know, I thought, yes, you know, I'll go. And I began to go to people's homes and businesses, and, you know, I was now, I now became a debt collector. Hi, Michael. So we finally transferred to Cyprus, to the embassy in Cyprus, and we were based uh, in both Nicosia and Limassol. It was at this point when my father, he asked me if I could, if I could help him find this money for an operation in the region of 30 to 40,000. And I earned a lot of money in close protection and also debt collection as well, but I didn't have that money on me because I was living a, a loser's life. And I figured to myself, I'll just do some extra debt collection. I, went, I was collecting a debt from somebody living in a, f a five-star hotel. And I broke into this five-star hotel and, and, you know, this was like a palace up there. And I, 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 there, I, I you know, I made the person pay me the money and uh, I took extra money, but it wasn't enough. I beat them up and when I left their room, I was going to leave the hotel, but I thought to myself, well, if that guy was so rich and he's living in there, then I'll break into all the other, other floors, uh, rooms as well on that floor. And so I broke into all the other rooms on that floor and, and you know, I would steal the money. Hi. Is it here? And I'm standing in the Limassol Police, Central Police Station. I feel so nervous to be here. Um, my heart's beating, pounding me. Um, obviously, when I um, committed those crimes, I was obviously arrested and I was brought here to this um, police station and uh, I've already spent near to maybe a month in the, re in the, in the remand cell, which is, I think, somewhere out behind me. And um, it was very hard going. We had a pile of crimes that high. Um, I wouldn't speak to the police, the CID officers. You know, I was very stubborn and very hard. But they would, they would um, beat me to speak, and um, they were playing good cop, bad cop. And, you know, eventually I admitted to everything. But I was, I, in total, I did about a month in this remand cell, which is um, a very, very badly kept cell. Soon after that, they sentenced me to a three-year prison sentence in Nicosia Central Prison. Oh, that's how they, okay. I remember him as well. Do you remember Bolo? Yes. 
The life inside this prison was really horrific for me when I first arrived here. 15 years ago, it was a very different place to what it is today. Every day was a day for self-preservation, because there will be people doing horrible things to each other in this place. And so from day one, I was very violent. If you weren't able to defend yourself, and um, then, you know, then some other person would take advantage of you and maybe, you know, start to uh, have sex, you know, and, and make you a little bit little slave, you know? And you couldn't go, go to anybody to complain about that. Many tears and much blood was shed in this place. And the prison officers were very um, um, distanced from the prisoners. People were left to do their own thing. And you know, you'd pass your hours away. It was an open situation. Um, but sometimes if they left you locked in your cell, you'd be left sometimes locked for days. And you know, you would get you'd pass the time by smoking your <laughs> away or taking drugs. Um, or you know, cutting away at your, your wrists, you know, there are lots of self-harmers here, or cutting somebody else up. You know, three of your lifelines that keep you sane in, in a prison is the people you might be able to phone if you're allowed to use the telephone, the people that visit you, and the people that obviously write letters to you. And, you know, none of my friends or my family wrote a single letter to me, and none of them wanted to come and see me because I was, I was bad news. But the one thing that really spoke into my life was I got this letter from a complete stranger. My own friends and family couldn't be bothered to write to me or visit me, but this stranger wrote to me, and that really spoke into my life. That would have showed right from the beginning um, that he didn't have anyone there. Now, also, I know that one of the things, like the other prisoner that I was visiting too, was that I could provide him with a, a Coca-Cola and something to eat. Uh, and uh, that even in that, I knew by this time that even that was something that, was, that they didn't get when they were on inside. They only got that in the visiting room. I was starting to think, you know, why does this guy want to see me? What, does he want to convert me or make me some sort of Bible basher? And I was pretty sure he wanted to, to, you know, to change me or get something from these visits. It was a while before Tony started to talk about the things that were going on uh, inside. Um, I mean, I was a stranger to him. He was a stranger to me, so he, wouldn't, he, he wasn't going to open up and everything to me right from the beginning. But as we, as we became friends, I suppose, as time went on, and you, you do become friends as you visit week by week, um, then little bits would have come out. He never judged me once. M normally the first thing um, a prisoner is asked is, what have you done to be in prison? How long are you, are, you, are, you, are you serving? And all these sorts of details. They want the gory details. Whereas Michael, he was not interested in that. He was interested in something far deeper than that. And he wasn't trying to convert me. But he was like, um, it's like a, a beggar. He was like a beggar that's found some food and he's wanting to share, share it with another beggar, and that's me. I'm always happy to share friendship. Um, it does include sharing my life, but in the end, it's friendship for those that need friendship. He shared with me about um, the thing that was the most important thing in his life. And, and he told me that was Jesus Christ. Now for me, I had no concept of this at all because I was a Buddhist. I did not believe in God. I had got myself so down the wrong road in life, I became violent and aggressive, and here I was in this prison. But, but um, I took on that message of hope, the fact that, you know, that people even as, as lost as me can be transformed from the inside and out by knowing Jesus Christ as my savior. Yeah, yeah. Now, he did become a very close friend as time went on. Um, but um, my heart was to, in befriending people, to share the freedom that I had got myself from uh, getting to know Christ. But it was, it was more than that. I wanted to, to befriend. Uh, and so they, they were happy.
you know, being cage shop for three years, where literally every single month some guy would get beaten up or cut up or gang raped or even killed, it just does something to your brain. And so I found it really hard to just be in society, you know. People were concerned because he nose. He, had a nose. he kind of had a different approach to, to life, as it were. But well, I don't think I've ever felt that there was anything in, in, in his past that, that could come between us because, in a sense, I've always felt that a line was drawn when he, when he gave his heart to the Lord, when he became a Christian, a line was drawn there and that was, was finished. And I never knew that person. And the person I know now is what I'm interested in and therefore I've felt that in the 15 years that I've known him he's been consistently honest with me all the time and therefore that's that's what I know and just there's no I wouldn't say there's any distrust of of that because that, that was who he was and that's not who he is now. I work as a full-time evangelist and I go to prisons, schools, universities, churches, concerts, festivals and I, I really um, share the message of God, the gospel message with, um, with people from all walks of life. I'm the author of um, the book Taming the Tiger which is now published in 14 languages. Because if they slip on the floor or somebody tries to hurt them. Very controversial uh, but extremely interesting. Myself, I'm agnostic but I found the experience of listening to him, I found it very rewarding. I called on the, on the name of Jesus Christ and Jesus saved my life in a real life situation. And from that day on I realised that I did not need to use my Kung Fu anymore. I can't really see Jesus doing Kung Fu either, but never once did he hurt, hit people and beat people. I also believe that there's a spiritual background to Kung Fu which is founded in Buddhism because it was developed by a Buddhist monk. It was developed so that Buddhist monks could gain a further control of their mind and their body, the very core of, of, of Buddhism. And for me, you know, when Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. Well, I've heard of the way of Kung Fu, the way of the dragon, the way of the tiger. And in the world, there's many ways, but Jesus is the way. And I'd rather go that one right 